Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to today's Berkeley conversation on COVID-19 and forced displacement in the Global South. I'm Carson Cristiano. I'm the executive director of SIGA, a hub for research on global development. We're headquartered at UC Berkeley with about 120 faculty affiliates along the west coast of North America. SIGA researchers use rigorous evaluations and tools from data science to evaluate the impact of, of large scale social and economic development programs. We're delighted to be hosting today's uh, conversation along with our colleagues at Innovations for Poverty Action and the Joint Data Center on Forced Displacement. We hope this will be the first in a series of webinars that these three organizations co-host on this topic. So today's, uh, for those who don't know, IPA is a research and policy nonprofit that discovers and promotes effective solutions to global poverty. Through its humanitarian and forced displacement initiative, IPA supports the development of rigorous research in humanitarian settings to help decision makers develop better programs and policies. Throughout the pandemic, they've been running a series of webinars as part of IPA's Research for Effective COVID-19 Response or Recover efforts. This webinar is part of that series and I encourage anyone joining us today to check out their website for uh, a huge amount of resources um, coming out of our combined networks. Today's webinar is also part of the JDC event series on forced displacement, which provides researchers, practitioners, and other stakeholders with a platform for discussing topics of immediate relevance on forced displacement. The Joint Data Center is a partnership between the World Bank and UNHCR. It launched about a year ago with the support of the government of Denmark, the EU, and the US government. The center works with several international organizations national statistics offices and academic institutions to collect, analyze, and disseminate population data and primary socioeconomic microdata, which helps stakeholders make timely and evidence-informed decisions that improve people's lives. Right now, the JDC is conducting a series of high-frequency phone surveys, which will help answer uh, important questions about changes in welfare, vulnerabilities and the potential recovery of forcibly displaced people from COVID-19. And you'll hear about one of these surveys uh, being carried out in Bangladesh today. Before we dive in, I want to briefly frame the issue that we're here to talk about. So refugees are already some of the most vulnerable people in the world, having fled their homes because of violence and persecution, economic hardship and environmental stress due to climate change. COVID exposes them to a whole new set of threats uh, so uh, forcibly displaced are at higher risk for contracting the disease because they live in densely populated low resource areas where social, social distancing and proper hand hygiene can be difficult, if not impossible to achieve. Treatment can be challenging and complex, especially if people are concurrently suffering from other common diseases like tuberculosis, malaria, or diabetes. Um, testing can be difficult as well. I think the WHO reported recently that testing for those with symptoms of COVID in Cox's Bazaar was extremely low because people feared being isolated from their families, being deported, uh, and the stigma that comes along with being diagnosed. Um, of course, all of these immediate risks have untold implications for longer term social and economic outcomes, which is something that SIGA and I think everyone on our panel today um, is very interested in. In and concerned with. So in order to respond effectively to this crisis now and over the longer term, we need accurate and timely information about what is happening on the ground. And accurate and timely information is particularly hard to come by in settings where dwellings are temporary, people have legitimate reasons to fear providing information to authority figures, and in some cases they simply lack means of communication with surveyors. So in Bangladesh, uh, for example, the government shut down internet and mobile phone communication uh, to all Rohingya refugees about a year ago. It's with this backdrop that we're eager to share the findings from various ongoing and recently completed studies coming out of our extended network on forced displacement and COVID-19. We're very lucky to have four panelists with us here today who are deeply immersed in these issues. We have Mushfiq Mubarak, he's a professor of economics at Yale and faculty director of YRISE, the Yale Research Initiative on Innovation and Scale. He'll tell us about findings coming out of his work with Rohingya refugees and host communities in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. 
Nandini Krishnan, a senior economist with the Poverty Global Practice at the World Bank, will talk about a different set of questions she's exploring in the same region. Dennis Egger, an economics PhD candidate at UC, at UC Berkeley, is working closely with UNHCR and the World Bank in Kenya, and will share some uh, new findings coming out of that work. And finally, we have Dan Stein, who's a chief economist at ID Insight, who will discuss findings from a recent study that ID Insight is doing on lockdowns in Western Uganda, as well as insights from an ongoing cash transfer evaluation being conducted with the NGO Give Directly. So today we're gonna to start with short 10-minute um, presentations from each panelist and then open the floor to questions from the audience. Um, a big thanks to those who have already submitted questions through our Google form. If you'd like to ask a question at any time during the event, um, I'm sure that things will come up as we go along. Please go ahead and submit them either through uh, the UC Berkeley Facebook page where this is being streamed or the YouTube page. And please do share your name and affiliation so that the panelists know who the question is coming from, if you're comfortable with it. And finally, this panel is being recorded. Um, it will be available to watch as soon as the event is over, I believe. And we really appreciate you sharing this link with any colleagues you think might be interested in these important topics. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Mushfik Mobra from Yale. Uh, thanks very much, Carson. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, our efforts to collect data on the Rohingya refugee population, uh, uh, most of whom you know, streamed across the border in Jul around, around July, like summer of 2017. There are about a million uh, refugees in who are living in um, like the southernmost districts of Bangladesh bordering bordering Myanmar, and so we collected data on the Rohingya refugees, but also on uh, host communities. So, so Bangladeshis were living close to where the camps were set up, as well as Bangladeshis living a little bit further away from the camps, but in the same region, as a point of comparison. Uh, so I'll share my screen, um, and. Uh, the work is joined with like my two most frequent collaborators on this are Austin Davis and Paula Lopez Pena. They were both uh, uh, postdocs at Yale. Um, Austin's at American University now, and Paula is on the on the market this year. Um, okay, so the a very brief brief background about the uh, about the panel survey that we that we started here is. Um, it was targeting the Rohingya refugees and about a million people um, have moved to Bangladesh uh, since uh, 2017. And we constructed in partnership with the World Bank, with, um, uh, with uh, Gage, oh, you have the partners down here, uh, with Gage, with um, uh, an IPA. So we constructed this uh, panel survey and um, and we've been you know back in 2017 uh, we we first con uh, did a, a very large sort of listing exercise touching uh, having touch points with about maybe 55,000 households and then based on that chose 5,000 households um, uh, as a representative sample half refugees and half um, members of the host communities and during the COVID period we followed up with uh, around two and around three um, in April and July of 2020. Okay. And we've been also using the sample and especially the listing areas that, are, that have not been sampled by the CVPS, the 55,000 minus the 5,000, to run some interventions in partnership with uh, UNHCR. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm just going to try and give you a broad overview of the various lines of work we're doing, and uh, rather than get into the details of, of any, any, any one result. So our strategy here is first to document the lives of refugees in Bangladesh, their economic lives, their history of trauma, et cetera. Right? And a second strategy uh, that we're pursuing is to try and link the uh, CBPS, the Cox Bazar panel survey data that we are collecting in Bangladesh in person and then on the phone to the history of violence in Myanmar, like trying to identify exactly where people come from and then getting data on the Myanmar side of the border on, uh, on, uh, on the history of violence. And we're also during the COVID period tracking, you know, refugee health syndromes, uh, like health, um, you know, medical symptoms, um, as well as the employment shocks, uh, economic shocks, etc. In the COVID period, uh, and then also uh, motivated by 
the findings from the data, uh, design and implement some interventions that are promising in the sense of they might help either the host communities or, or the other or refugees. And with the different um, outputs that are coming out, we are targeting, and I'll, I'll give you brief examples of this. Uh, uh, we're targeting messages to the Bangladeshi government and to my fellow citizens in Bangladesh and, and civil society, uh, but also international development partners uh, who have large presence there, such as UNHCR, IRC, et cetera. Uh, but also trying to do some research and analysis that should speak to the international geopolitical conversation which is a much more complicated conversation involving Myanmar and Bangladesh, but also uh, countries like India and China that are interested in investing in Myanmar um, and, and the United States. Okay, let me skip over. I mean, we've learned a lot even before collecting data, we've learned a lot from conversations with, um, with the, uh, the Rohingyas who, who were here. So let me, let me try to give you one example of what we're trying to say to uh, my fellow citizen in Bangladesh. Okay, so this is a, what I'm going to show you here is um, data on like this is the distribution of earnings right for three populations. So the camp population, which is Rohingya refugees, they're both the post 2017 arrivals as well as other Rohingyas who had arrived prior to 2017. So the yellow line is uh, Rohingyas, and then the blue line are Bangladeshis. Uh, who happen to live, to be living close to the refugee camps, like the refugee camps happen to be built, you know, surrounding their communities. Right? And then the gray line is um, Bangladeshis who live a little bit further away from the camps. Okay, so those are the three populations we've been tracking. And pre-displacement, so pre-2017, we collected a lot of information about what their life was like, their earnings, as well as, you know, assets that they had, the land that they had, etc. And if you look at the distribution of earnings or assets, right, it looks like, you know, the three lines are right on top of each other. So not only were Bangladeshis were living on this side of the Naf River, very similar and comparable to the Rohingyas who were forcibly displaced, right? Not only were they comparable on average, right? The entire distribution seems to be right on top of each other. And in fact, in terms of assets, like the only difference we find is if anything in the opposite direction where the Rohingyas had access to greater land than the average Bangladeshi does on this on our side of the border, right? And that's probably not surprising given the differential population density of the of the two populations. Okay. And here's what happens to after, right after displacement. So there is the Rohingyas lot a lot lost a lot uh, in terms of of course earnings capacity, but also their assets, right? So their line kind of sharply shifts to the left. Okay. So the sharply shifts to the left uh, indicates that they now have lower earnings capacity, lower assets relative to their new neighbors, which are Bangladeshis living in those districts, Kothbazar, Rukia, uh, and those sub-districts uh, closer where the camps are. Right? So the point here is, you know, that it's important, an important message to share with Bangladeshis is that, you know, it's, this imposes a lot of hardship on people living in those districts in Cox's Bazar, right? But you know, we were refugees once ourselves in 1971, right? And, and uh, there was, there's nothing fundamentally different about the set of people who had come over. They look, they looked before 2017, just like us, right? In terms of their economic characteristics, but they had really bad luck, okay? All right, so the second thing I want to show you was a set of results on what happened in the post COVID period. But since I'm running out of time, I think I'm gonna skip over this because Nandini uh, and the World Bank, I, I suspect I mean, they've been doing some post COVID surveys on the same population. So I'll just let her talk about this. I'm gonna skip over like what we learned from, um, uh, from the post COVID surveys. And uh, I'll just skip over to talking about violence in uh, Myanmar, okay? Um, so we're trying to, you know, we, we collected data on the patterns and history of violence in Myanmar to do this for uh, related things, right? So one is looking at data on like the history of violence, who starts it, like what is the initial event? Is it a protest by Buddhist monks? Is it, a, is it an attack by Arsa or is it an attack by uh, the Tatmado, the, the Myanmar government um, and military appar apparatus, okay? And, and then once the attacks occur, what's hap what happens next, right? What's the pattern of fatalities, the, the, the magnitude of fatalities on the, among Rohingyas or among uh, government forces, okay? Uh, 
and are there is there symmetry? And the reason why this is important to point out over here is uh, that you know, Aung San Suu Kyi and the Burmese government have been claiming that there's a lot of violence on both sides. It's just a give and take, right? Which, and our, and our data clearly indicate that that's not true. Okay? And then we also look at other, you know, internal violence in Myanmar and look at the intensity of the violence against Rohingya relative to violence against other ethnic minorities. Are they systematically different? And the answer is they are. Okay? And then we also uh, combine all this violence data with data on economic outcomes on the Min Myanmar side. So it turns out these are rice growing areas, Rakhine state, uh, bordering Bangladesh where the Rohingya live. And the years in which rice prices are particularly high, what you observe is systematically greater violence exactly in the areas that are particularly suitable for rice cultivation, where rice productivity is high. And that's data coming from the FAO in Rome. Okay, so so it appears that you know this is not just violence that's responding to uh, Rohingya attacks. It's um, uh, it's, um, it's 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 systematic in nature, where there are some systematic economic determinants of the violence. And then finally, we uh, we connect this to data on trauma and stress that we collected on the Bangladeshi side of the border from the CBPS data, right, where we track uh, the consequences of violence on stress and mental health using um, like established trauma questionnaires. Um, okay, and maybe uh, I just wanna do a time check to see if I should stop or... Yeah, you are at time. If you could just wrap up quickly and... Oh, sure. Okay, so let me, let, me, let me just show you one, one result and then I'll, I'll stop. Uh, what should I do? Yeah, so... Um, so yeah, so the A, I just want to I just want to point out the nature of the asymmetry here. Okay, so here's here's some impulse impulse response function starts with, like on a particular day, normalized to a day when there are Buddhist protesters, in Rakhine State against the presence of Rohingya there, right? And once that protest happens, this is followed by some violence where you know there there are there is some in, in increase in like Rohingya perpetrated violence, right? But the, but the key thing that we find in all, all of this data analysis is that this ultimately results in hugely asymmetric effects where there's a large number of Rohingya fatalities, small number of non-Rohingya fatalities, right? And the large number of Rohingya fatalities are often focused on concentrating on civilians. Okay? And let me, that's just one result. And then in the q and I can, if, if you're interested, I can talk about other things also there. Thanks, Mushfik. Nandini, do you want to go ahead? Sure, thank you. And thanks to Mushfik for doing some of my data intro um, for me. So let me just make sure I can share my screen. Great, thank you. So um, this, uh, this presentation also builds on on work uh, leveraging the Cox's Bazaar panel survey, which is joint with uh, Yale, IPA, and GW's Gage and the World Bank. Um, so this is part of a, um, a, a, a larger um, set of activities uh, done by the World Bank, um, focusing on, on providing some quick insights into the labor market impacts of, of the COVID-19 crisis. So there are we're running surveys in all eight uh, South Asia countries and in Bangladesh in particular, we have a nationwide random digit dialing survey. And then um, these three kind of final follow-ups in Dhaka, Chittagong and in Cox's Bazaar. Um, the, the presentation today, I'll focus on, on findings from, from this representative panel survey. Um, and in particular, we use the baseline data, which was collected between March and August 2019, and a first round follow-up, which was collected between April and May uh, of this year. Um, a second round is currently ongoing. Um, some very quick background. So in addition to, to what Mushfik described, so Cox's Bazaar isn't actually one of the poorest uh, districts of Bangladesh. It has been sort of steadily uh, improving its performance in poverty reduction, but it is quite disadvantaged in some other ways, uh, particularly in terms of human capital accumulation. So uh, in, in many senses, it, this is a really relatively poor host community that is hosting um, refugees. 
Um, it's also heavily reliant on agriculture and subsistence sort of livelihoods, informal in the services sector. Um, and is also constrained by limited connectivity to the rest of the country, particularly the growth hubs of, of uh, Dhaka and, uh, and Chittagong. Um, it's also the future home of a very large set of capital investments, including a deep sea port. Um, but you know, given the nature of the investments, it's unlikely to affect many of the of the people in in Cox's Bazaar itself. Um, very quickly, um, some additional context um, in terms of the setting of, of uh, the camps that we're talking about. Um, as Mutrik mentioned, there's about more than a million Rohingya, including 300,000 who had settled and were registered as refugees from previous influxes before the 2017 influx. Um, primarily, um, the new Rohingya camps are built around existing camps in two sub-districts. These are the southernmost sub-districts of Cox's Bazar, Teknap and Ukia. And um, consequently, this is one of, if not the most uh, densest, you know, camp settings in the world. Um, so that obviously has major implications in terms of, um, of, the, of disease transmission, but also in terms of access to basic um, housing, sanitation, um, all of which are, are major concerns from, from the perspective of the pandemic. Um, now, from, from the point of view of Cox's Bazar, as you all know, Bangladesh is one of the most densely populated countries in the world, but this influx has created a large increase in localized density, even in this context. Um, the population of the district itself has increased by 30%. Um, in Ukia, displaced Rohingya now account for as many as four out of five persons. And if you look at the map, it's the, on the left panel, it's the pre-2017 uh, Rohingya influx density of the Upazilas or sub-districts in, in Cox's Bazar. On the right is once you take into account um, the, the Rohingya who have, uh, who have come across the border. And Ukia is now uh, far more densely populated than even the, the district headquarters. Um, as Murshvik mentioned, uh, this is the, the findings are building off a, a baseline survey which was collected in 2019. Um, it's roughly 5,000 households divided in half between Rohingya camps and then two strata of host communities, uh, high exposure hosts. So these are Bangladeshi households living within a three hour walking distance from the camps and low exposure um, is, is sort of those who are living further away. The tracking survey um, attempted to recontact um, 4, 000, roughly 4,000 households out of the uh, 5,000 baseline households. Um, the objective of the survey was to update recontact information, but also to collect some very quick information on, on labor market impacts, assistance, and food security. Um, what we know from the CBPS already is that the, the displaced population is extremely young um, and with very, very low human capital accumulation. Um, so very low to no literacy, huge gender gaps. And, and the status quo at baseline was that of a population that was heavily reliant on aid, um, on food, food, its food consumption was almost entirely um, provided by humanitarian assistance. And the only sort of very limited sources of income were selling and bartering some of this um, assistance. Now, going to the results, some of the, the main sort of headline labor market changes in, in Cox's Bazaar. Um, so as you'll see from, from the graphs, um, for the hosts, you don't have too much of a change in terms of labor force participation or, or, or employment. There is a small, inc there's some increase in unemployment. But that hides the fact that almost two out of three adults who do report being employed were not actively working and they were temporarily absent from work. Um, and this contrasts with less than 1% of temporary absence before COVID. Um, among the Rohingya, you see um, much lower rates of labor force participation, um, but a sharp decline in employment um, and an increase in unemployment between the baseline and the follow-up. Um, now, the, um, the labor market impacts on the hosts in Cox's Bazaar have, like in the rest of Bangladesh, been quite gendered. Um, women seem to have worn the brunt in terms of being more likely to be unemployed. 
This is not necessarily driven here in Cox's Bazaar by a, um, a, a sharp increase in job losses, but rather by sort of pressures to have to look for work because of higher temporary absence among the male breadwinners. Um, and this is more, the effects are sharper in low exposure areas. So these are the more urbanized settings further away from the camps. Um, among the Rohingya, as I mentioned, we had already very low rates of, of labor force participation. But the sharp decline you see in employment, uh, two thirds of that occurred before March 1st, so before COVID. Um, and there's there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, one is a change in, in policy um, of the government of Bangladesh, which was a, a ban on the use of cash, particularly for the cash for work programs in the camps in 2019, in September. Um, and another is the sort of more direct effect of COVID, which was reduced operations in the camps, which meant that many humanitarian programs were scaled back to a minimum um, effort. And you see that in, in, in the fact that most of the job losses on this very low base were happened before March. Um, now, this has had obviously some uh, implications on, on coping and, uh, and access to assistance. So prior to COVID at baseline, um, we found that humanitarian assistance had been quite successful in delivering basic caloric needs. There was no significant difference between um, the average caloric consumption of a Rohingya refugee or of the host community. Um, but the heavy reliance on sort of a limited basket of food aid is expressed more in terms of dissatisfaction with the diversity of food available among the refugees. Um, unfortunately, what's happened with, um, with some of the restrictions placed after COVID is that these very um, initiatives to expand dietary diversity and invest in better nutrition have been stalled, um, and you see that in the in the post uh, in in the current follow-ups, where you see increase sort of more households reporting that they are not receiving the same level of assistance they were receiving before, um, particularly uh, the WFP food assistance, and and that basically reflects there hasn't really been a change in. Um, the share of the population receiving assistance, but there has been a change in terms of a shift towards a basic fixed food basket as opposed to a more flexible um, way of delivering food assistance. So I will um, I'll summarize. So as we're finding in some of our other surveys in Bangladesh and in the rest of South Asia, it's the relatively more urbanized areas that have been more adversely affected by the fallout of COVID. Um, in the high exposure areas, host communities closer to camps, they're relatively more rural, more reliant on agriculture. And this has, has meant that they've been somewhat more protected. It's not that they haven't faced losses, but it's just uh, of a different degree. The Rohingya population, in addition to the, the sort of high direct risks of living in such a dense um, setting, also remains more vulnerable to external changes in, um, in, in government policy and programming. Um, and this means that you see these very large effects um, of, of these changes in policy on, uh, on a very low base of labor force participation. Um, I should say that among the Rohingya, we find that women are less affected than men in terms of changes in, in their labor market participation. And that's for two reasons. One is that only 9% of, of Rohingya women were participating in the labor force at baseline, and most of them were working at home. So tailoring, uh, perhaps poultry, uh, but very sort of activities that weren't reliant on going outside the house. Um, and the second caveat is that um, being a panel, um, our, um, let's say our inability to, our ability to con recontact um, in the camps was, um, was the most difficult. And within that, it's the most, um, the young women with the least amount of education who were less likely to be successfully recontacted. So there may be a bias that comes out of, um, of that. Um, and finally, uh, a, a kind of fallout of, of this is a limited access to assistance and um, limited sort of means to use the food for bartering and to get additional income. So I will stop there.
and obviously happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Nandini. A quick follow up for Mushvik, for you and Mushvik um, from the audience. Um, will the Cox's Bazaar survey data be publicly available or is any of it already publicly available? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, the, the goal is to make all of it publicly available. And um, I believe we have, I, I'm not sure if you shared it with individuals who've asked or if you have it online, but uh, like the COVID surveys have, uh, have been shared with some other researchers as well. So maybe, um, you know, uh, maybe people can send me an email and then I can figure out with IPA how to, how to make it uh, public. Excellent, thanks so much. Dennis, you're up. Can you hear me now? And then let me share my screen. Yeah, we can hear you. All right. All right, thanks everyone, thanks for having me. Um, I'm gonna present some really fresh work on um, the economic impact of COVID-19 on refugees in Kenya. Uh, this is joint work with um, Reza Beltramo at UNHCR, with Johan Pop at the World Bank, a team at Berkeley here with Ed Miguel, and Michael Walker, uh, Magdalena uh, at Buzara Center in Nairobi, and then uh, our implementing uh, partner on the ground, uh, Remit Kenya, uh, headed or sort of um, led by Sam Belongo and Carol Nakesa. Um, okay, so um, what I'm going to present today is sort of new data collected between early May and late September on trends in economic and social uh, pub and public health outcomes for refugees and non refugees in Kenya. So this data is based on about 12,000 phone surveys conducted over two rounds so far in representative samples of the approximately 500,000 refugees in Kenya that are registered with UNHCR and the current Kenyan population. And that sort of survey is built on a hybrid between previously surveyed households in a, in, a, in a household survey conducted in 2016 and a random digit dialing approach to sort of get at some of the households that may have started up since then or may have changed their number. The data captures five months so far from May to September. We're currently doing a round three and maybe round four later, but, but I'm only gonna present uh, data from the first two rounds so far. Um, the way we've designed those surveys is that we sort of contact a random subset in each week, which makes this, these surveys representative sort of each month. And what I'm gonna presenting, be presenting to you how is sort of monthly averages over time. So we have sort of you know, a snapshot of how these, um, how the crisis evolves in these different samples uh, over these five months. The response rates are 51% for refugees and 33% at the national survey, which of course are not, not as nice as, as they would be in in-person surveys, but they're fairly high given these are phone-based activities, some of, some of which are, are random digit dialing. Um, to account for this sort of non-response, we sort of reweight um, our results um, to, to make them more representative of the, of the overall populations. As part of our surveys, we also collect, collect retrospective data for February for outcomes that we think are reasonably remembered um, back to February. And the main question that we had in mind when designing these surveys is sort of, but really how much has economic activity fallen during the ongoing COVID-19 crisis and sort of where refugees uh, particularly hard hit. Uh, just sort of as, as a background, it's very difficult, of course, to, to measure um, economic activity in these settings. A lot of activity is informal. Usually uh, the way this is done is sort of by conducting long consumption LMS, LSMS style uh, consumption modules and household surveys. Of course, that wasn't an option during COVID. And so what we've done in our team is basically build on this decades of experience of measuring poverty and measuring economic activities and trying to translate them uh, to something that is, that is doable over the phone. All right, just to give you a little bit of a background. So uh, the 500,000 refugees in Kenya are located mainly in three areas. So about uh, 200,000 or so in Dadaab uh, near, near Somalia on the right, about 200,000 in Kakuma, Albay and about you know, 100,000 100, plus in Nairobi and other parts of the country, but mostly in Nairobi. 
Um, refugees in Kenya are mostly Somalian and, and coming from South Sudan, although there's significant populations coming from, from the Congo as well. As you see here with the, with the birth, um, with quite a substantial amount of, of refugees being born in Kenya, some of these populations have lived in Kenya for quite some time, since the 90s uh, and onwards. So just to give you a brief sense of how this looks, this is Kalobi camp uh, in 2019. And when we're talking about these camp uh, populations, this is sort of what you should, what you should. All right, just a brief overview over sort of the COVID trajectory in Kenya. So the first case was confirmed on 13th March and then within a week, there were fairly substantial uh, lockdown measures. Uh, working from home was, was ordered. Uh, if possible, schools were closed, international flights banned, there was a, a national desk to dawn curfew, and weekly markets were closed. So, so fairly substantial uh, measures uh, uh, taken very quickly. Maybe what's uh, particularly relevant for this context, there was complete secession of movement into and out of these refugee camps fairly early on, and the World Food Program sort of started delivering bi-monthly, sort of two-month rations at the same time to, to reduce uh, contact and promise to increase cash assistance by $1 per capita. And we'll, we'll see it in our data whether, whether we can detect that. And then the first case was confirmed in May. Since then, there's sort of been a partial reopening. Uh, there's a, a national stimulus package started in May. And then there's a gradual reopening of places of worship and local air travel sort of starting July onwards. And then in August, international flight through resume. This is sort of what the, what the case trajectory looked like, just to give you guys a background. Um, initially, they were quite successful at containing uh, the, the, uh, the crisis, but then as, as restrictions sort of went uh, down, cases also went up. And of course, this also reflects increased testing. Official case numbers in the camps are quite low. So by the end of August, they were sort of still below, below 100 in, 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 in both cases. Although again, this is, to be taken with a grain of salt given, given limited testing. All right, so let's, let's dive into our data. So ref, we have about 2,000 uh, refugee households in our sample and about 5,500 uh, in, in our national sample. And you know, we're, we're quite, these, these samples are quite similar on sort of basic characteristics. There's about four household members per household. They're roughly 33 year olds, 33 year old on average, and, and there's 50, 50 men and women. Uh, unsurprisingly, given what Mushvik has already showed, um, refugees tend to be significantly poor on average. So, so February household earnings are significantly lower by, by about 40%. They're less likely to be engaged in agriculture and less likely to be employed even, even before the crisis. So this is a very vulnerable population. When it comes to sort of coping mechanisms with the crisis, so fewer of them have health insurance, although it's not statistically significant, fewer of them own radios, and, and fewer, fewer children attend at school, although I want to point out that even in refugee camps, about 90% of households reported their children going to school uh, in February. All right, so let's, let's, let's get into it. Uh, the, the first question we wanna tackle is how deep is the recession? And what we find is it's, it's very deep and it's especially deep for refugees. So total household earnings fell by about 70% between February and May to June for, for Kenya as a whole and then 87% for refugees. And there's some degree or some sense of a, re uh, of a recovery underway, particularly for refugees, but there's some questions that remain, particularly around how this recovery is coming about. And I'll, I'll get into that in more detail as, as we go along. So here's our data. Um, this is sort of how all graphs are gonna look. On the bottom, you have months. This is calendar months uh, from January to September. Um, and then you have in blue, the, the trajectory for refugees and in red uh, for the national sample. Um, so you see there's quite a pronounced drop in total household incomes per capita. This includes income from agriculture, from self-employment and any employment income uh, all aggregated up and, and sort of refugees especially go almost to, to zero income during these intense periods of the crisis. And the second part sort of as our round two survey started in September, we see that there is somewhat of a recovery for refugees. And in fact, at the end, sort of we cannot uh, reject that they're back to, back to where they were in, in, in February. And this is definitely not the case for Kenya. Kenya as a whole still remains sort of 40% below, below um, February incomes. 
We see a similar pattern when we look at the share uh, of uh, employed households that were laid off. That's about 10% in, in, in March and April, so similar to other, other places, or the total number of hours worked. Again, for refugees, this goes down a lot, much more than it does um, for um, Kenya as a whole. Um, how are households coping? Well, it, is it partially it's, it's through savings. So the national sample, we see quite substantial dis savings per capita. We don't see that for refugees uh, with, the, with the reason presumably being that there's less access to loans for, for refugees and, and less access to savings or assets as a whole that they would be able to sell over that period. Um, do we see increased support by NGOs and governments? Unfortunately for refugees, the answer is no. In fact, it even decreased, although we cannot statistically uh, reject that it stayed the same. There's a small increase for the national sample, but it's obviously still very low for refugees. Um, we do see an increase in an in, in influx of uh, remittances by about 40 cents on the dollar. Um, but again, of course, it's nowhere near enough to, to overcome these, these huge um, drops in, in, um, in income that we saw before. So the consequence uh, of all of this basically is that there's a huge drop in food um, insecurity. So if we ask what share of the sample uh, had to skip or cut back on meals, particularly for refugees, that is very, very high during, during the height of the crisis at, at 60 to 70 percent. Dennis, we're at 10 minutes, so go ahead and wrap up if you can. Okay. So the, the one uh, pattern that, that we want to explain is sort of why is it possible for refugees to, to recover faster than it is for the, for the national sample? And what we see here is that it's basically by going back out and work and engaging in in-person interactions. So while in Kenya as a whole, the number of in-person interactions has remained fairly stable and fairly low, refugees basically have to or have decided to, that, that they have to go back to work and earn, and earn income. And when, when we see sort of what they're most worried about, we see that there's a huge increase, at least after September, uh, where refugees say they're, they're worried about about income and employment. And so, so our interpretation tentatively is that after two, three months of really high food insecurity, low incomes and lockdowns, there's basically no choice except going back to work, engaging in, in in-person interactions and, and sort of you know, making, making ends meet. So far, we don't see an increase in symptoms, but you know, that's, that's uh, to be caveated with the you know, difficult nature of, of collecting data of that sort. Um, well, basically leaves us with, with two questions. Were these lockdowns good overall? Did they do more harm uh, or, or, or not? And then sort of what can we do to alleviate some of these impacts? And I think Dan is gonna, gonna talk about that next. And then we're also of course worried about potential long-term effects, particularly on children as you know, educational activities still, still stay below where they were and food insecurity is known to, to have potential long-run impacts as well. Sorry for going a little bit over time. If you're interested, all of our data on 30,000 households, not just these samples, but many other samples uh, is available on uh, kenyacovidtracker.org. So please check that out. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dennis. And we'll definitely get into some of these longer term impacts in the Q&A. I think it'd be great to hear from all of you and what you think based on what you're learning. Um, Dan, you're up. Yep, you're muted. Oh, hello, muted. Okay. Hi, oh. thanks everybody. So I'm going to talk today about a an experiment that I'm doing with a few team members in uh, in the Kiriandongo refugee camp in Uganda. So let's just jump into it. Uh, so we're working with Give Directly, who a lot of you are probably have probably heard of. And basically, what Give Directly does is it provides a one-off, unconditional cash transfer of roughly a thousand U.S. dollars, and they're providing this transfer to every single household in the Kiriandongo refugee settlement. So Kiriandongo is in the western part of Uganda has mostly uh, refugees from South Sudan and it's long-standing camp. So some people have been there um, for many years or even been born there. It's an extremely large transfer. It's roughly about 10% greater than the yearly aid given to a refugee family by the World Food Program transferred via mobile money. So why is this 
uh, interesting setting. Well, so there's a lot of evidence that these one-off unconditional cash transfers improve lives in the medium term. Bunch of papers written on that. Uh, but refugee settlements are different. There's aid dependency, there's fewer opportunities. So I think there's a lot of question about whether the same dynamics seen in some of these other studies are going to actually play out in the refugee camp. Can people start businesses? Can they be weaned off of aid? Will they migrate? There's a bunch of interesting questions. And then another thing that makes this work interesting, I hope, is that is the timing, which is that Co the COVID lockdown hit right after the cash transfer and while people were actually still getting some cash transfers in our treatment group. So we have a really interesting situation to try and understand how a big cash transfer is going to mitigate a big shock, which is hopefully going to speak to uh, the possibility of these types of interventions working in humanitarian settings. Now, what does this study look like? Looks like, well, it's a big multi-part setting. So we have a randomized trial with 1,200 refugees household using, using a phase-in design. We're gonna talk about that in a second. What's really cool about this study is it also includes a really in-depth longitudinal qualitative study that started with uh, 40 households, ended up having to switch to a lower sample on phone when COVID hit, um, but really in-depth interviews about lots of different topics that are gonna help us gain a more uh, nuanced view of of, uh, of what's going on. Um, we, were, we had a normal kind of baseline, end line design uh, originally, but then once COVID hit, we were fortunate to get some funding through rapid phone surveys that focus on COVID-19 and health outcomes <clears throat> nearer to the COVID shock. We also have an upcoming cross-sectional survey with 400 host communities who also are receiving transfers. Uh, and then an uh, end line on economic outcomes upcoming, which is now going to be done via the phone. So just a little bit about the RCT. Some people on the call might be saying, are you really randomizing cash transfers among the most vulnerable population? I think there's a few things to know. The first is that there's just, there was no way to make these 10,000 transfers all at once. Uh, Give directly has to go through the camp and enroll people and do a validation process. So the, the transfers needed to be staggered for logistical reasons, also for economic reasons, it, you couldn't really drop $10 million in, uh, in funds onto this relatively small camp. We didn't think the market could handle it. Uh, and actually Give Directly didn't quite have all the cash on hand at the start of the program. So it needed to be phased in. The question was how to phase it in. And the solution was this, a public lottery. You see one of our enumerators drawing a ping pong ball out of a, out of a bucket during food distribution. Um, so we did this randomized public lottery and specifically families where there were people with specific needs were not part of the lottery of the study. They were treated earlier. And 85% of the respondents said the randomization was the fairest approach possible to sequence these uh, transfers. A, a little bit on timing. Um, so everything is looking normal at the beginning of the study. There's a public lottery, then we run baseline. Give directly starts to distribute cash transfers to our treatment group. And then boom, COVID, hit, COVID hits right in the middle of this first cash distribution. So in March, Uganda has one of the harshest lockdowns in Africa, complete restriction on movement, basically no casual employment. Um, and that also hits our, hits our camp in the same way as the rest of Uganda. The other thing that happens is the World Food Program had some budgetary constraints, and they were already planning to decrease food and cash rations within the settlement by 30% in April. So it's a double whammy for these guys that there's a COVID lockdown that destroys employment opportunities, and then the food and cash rations go down in April. Um, there's also a lot of conflict happening in this period. There's a first case of COVID-19 in the camp in June, but it doesn't end up being a huge health issue there. And then we uh, conduct our, the first round of our follow-up in July. And we're gonna talk about the first two rounds of our rapid phone follow-up surveys. So a few quick results from those phone surveys, uh, as well as our ongoing qualitative work. So one thing we looked at is what's the psychological well-being, uh, and we see a, a pretty reasonable improvement in our treatment group by about 0.2 standard deviations. This is on an index um, that includes a bunch of standard uh, psychological well-being modules using the psychology literature. 
the fact that it's zero in control is uninteresting. That's just a normalization of the index. But I think it's important to know that we have a relatively uh, sizable increase off of a low base. And the, the qualitative work helps us understand how uh, psychologically traumatized this community has been uh, by the COVID-19 lockdown, a real worry about being able to feed their families to, gain, to, to get income for basic needs. Um, we also looked at food security. So it is in this situation, households are receiving food or cash transfers from the World Food Program, but they frequently report that it's not enough to meet their basic needs, especially after the decrease in rations. We see a, a modest increase in this food security index um, that's marginally statistically significant. Um, but respondents, especially in our qualitative work, are showing that there's overall difficulty in accessing food during this time, especially this particular phone survey was done before the harvest period, where food tends to be uh, a bit scarce. And respondents are also reporting uh, increases in food prices uh, caused by the lockdown. Um, there's also some worrisome reports of refugee communities being price gouged, as in they believe that they're, uh, they're receiving higher prices at the market than most communities. So we're still trying to dig into that issue. Um, now, we, we did our second phone survey round after the, after the harvest, and we didn't actually find an effect on the total value of food that people consumed. And this was a little bit surprising given the previous answer, previous results, but it's quite possible that the harvest eased a lot of the food security difficulties. Uh, also, interestingly, we find nominally that the total value of food consumption seemed to have increased uh, compared to baseline, which was a bit of a surprise given, uh, given what some of the food difficulties we heard. Um, but we think this is mostly due to increased prices and also the fact that a lot of children who used to be away at school are at home. So we have this quote from Qual that's mentioning that there's less food and children are at home, so now they actually need to eat more food than they used to when they were at school and prices have risen. Um, we also looked at a few different measures of intra-household conflict, and I'll just show a few of those. We looked at quarreling within the house, intimidation within the house, damaging goods within the houses. Uh, we didn't see huge difference in treatment and control on a bunch of these measures. We did see a decrease in the treatment group in within household intimidation. It's a little hard uh, to understand how to interpret that result uh, in, you know, as a as kind of one result in a bunch of non-results. So we're still thinking about that. But one thing we do find from the qual in from the qual study is it doesn't really look. We're not hearing stories of the cash transfer causing conflict. People seem to say that um, that how to use the cash transfer is being worked out relatively uh, trauma-free with the Just a, a quick little hits about COVID. We looked a lot about COVID-19 awareness, attitude and behavior. Uh, we find people to be relatively well versed about COVID, although a lot of people don't realize that you can have asymptomatic transmission. Um, most people feel like they're relatively well protected from COVID. This is probably because there aren't that many cases in the camp. Um, and most people have access to things like masks and running water. Um, not huge differences between treatment and control in a lot of these issues. Specifically, we didn't see any differences in social interactions between treatment and control, but we did see moderately greater mask usage among the treatment group compared to control group, probably because um, most people had to purchase their masks. So that's all from me. Thanks, everyone. This is our our team of of five on this on the project, and our bigger team of enumerators. So thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dan. That was exactly ten minutes. So I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so I want to I want to ask a, a quick follow up to everyone, um, just to provide a little bit more context to to the conversation that we're about to have. Um, you know, in my introduction, I talked about how refugees are potentially more susceptible to COVID because of you know living in very highly dense areas and having limited access to you know soap and water and to for hand washing and things like that but it doesn't seem like 
COVID itself is the biggest threat here. And I want to understand, um, I think Dennis mentioned that cases are quite low in Kenyan camps, but just before we dive into these other questions, can, um, can the other panelists share, do you know what COVID rates currently are in among the populations that you're studying and how does that compare to the general population in those countries? I'm sure that there's a lot of underestimation because of lack of data, um, but you know, if you have any thoughts on that, it, it would be great to hear. It turns out it's been a surprise, uh, but uh, COVID uh, positivity rates are actually quite low among the Rohingya population it, relative to Bangladesh as a whole, relative to people in the surrounding host communities. Uh, so there's uh, teams of doctors, um, uh, you know, working with the WHO, right? To, and there is some data on, on testing. And that's not what, I mean, it doesn't accord with what people have feared given the high density in the, um, in the camps. People have feared, you know, like the disease spreading like wildfire. And it's also the case that in our data it was clear that there was a lot of misinformation, people, you know, hiding symptoms. But I think, you know, uh, so, so, you know, these are all surprises. So it's hard to theorize about that. So one theory is that given the scale of the humanitarian response in that area and the pre-existing infrastructure in that area. And the fact that there's been, you know, I, I know about some of these data just because there's a Yale doctor who reached out to me asking me, you know, because he was part of the WHO's expert team right, to, to deal with the crisis there. So there's, there's a lot of quick attention given. Uh, so it's possible that, that, that the humanitarian response was um, responsible for the uh, surprisingly good outcome. What about in Bangladesh as a whole? Uh, so Bangladesh as a whole, you know, I mean, of course, there is uh, there, you know, the point that you made about the caveats about uh, lack of testing is um, is, is going to be critical. Um, so recently, ICDDRB, uh, the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, which is based in Dhaka, uh, conducted a seroprevalence survey. I think a um, small sample and probably mostly concentrated in uh, Dhaka and surrounding areas. And they found that 45% of people are seropositive. So the, so the disease was quite, uh, quite uh, you know, uh, widespread, uh, or it had gone through. Uh, sero seropositivity is telling you about antibodies um, you know, over the past month or so. So the, the, it, it had spread, spread uh, quite a bit around, around the city, at least. OK, interesting. Um, Dan or Dennis, do you want to add anything, or Nandini, to this question? I would just say that also in in our in our setting, the uh, COVID rates have not been that high. They've been relatively low in all of Uganda, but seems even a little bit less. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think maybe just just mentioning the the, the thing on um, uh, refugee camps being fairly shut down fairly early and fairly rigorously in Kenya, at least, potentially contributes to this. So, as of late March, there was very little movement in and out and everyone that returned into the camp had to quarantine for 14 days and so i think that probably contributes to to some of the low numbers we see mm -hmm. i was thinking dennis was going to mention you know we've now put together data from various uh, samples in kenya including the refugee sample as well as uh, various samples in bangladesh around the country to jointly um you know track the socioeconomic impacts of the crisis in like 15 different samples in 10 mm -hmm. different countries and and so there, you know, um, you know, this, this is, is the IPA, a, say it again. Is this the IPA, uh, the multi-country survey? Uh, yeah. So, so it includes about four samples from Kenya. It includes about five samples from Bangladesh that we've been collecting, as well as the recovery surveys, which have been done in like eight other countries. So, so that's putting it all together. And, and, you know, we kind of took the least common denominators across all the surveys of what, you know, like the common elements from all these surveys in order to create giant tables on uh, like, what can we say that's uh, comparable across all these samples. And one of the things that, that, uh, that jumps out in, and this is all work, this is all Dennis's credit. Um, and one of the things that jumps out is that in the refugee samples relative to non-refugee samples within the same countries, the refugees are uh, res uh, responding like the Rohingya refugees that they are receiving a lot of say NGO government support, right? Whereas uh, NGO government support has not reached citizens of the countries that we've been, we've been tracking this across those 10 countries. Mm 
Okay, very interesting. Um, and I think all of the surveys that you mentioned, how can people learn about those surveys and what's being, what the insights are? Yes, uh, I think the main, main thing we need to do is it's the papers under revise and resubmit at a journal that normally embargoes uh, results. Okay. The main thing we need to do is like finish the paper and just get it published. Okay. <laughs> Coming soon. Um, all the Kenya data, as I mentioned, is on kenyacovidtracker.org. Um, we're still working on some of the micro data, um, although some of the World Bank and UNHCR samples are already up in an anonymized form uh, for everyone uh, public. And you can find the links on the website for all the other data. If you're interested, again, yeah, shoot me an email and I'm sure we can, we can help with the dissemination and help you address some of these questions that, that you might have and that our data might speak to. Great. So I wanna ask a couple of questions about data collection and, and also about potential bias. So we're talking about settings in which you know, it's virtually impossible to go and conduct face-to-face -face surveys. Maybe that's happening, um, but I think a lot of the data that you all are reporting on is has been collected through phone surveys. And so there are a few questions from our audience. Mira Saka from GeoPoll is interested in what specific tools and technologies have you used to conduct these surveys? Uh, Ewan McLeod from UNHCR, um, what's the best way to design representative sampling for phone surveys? I think a lot of the studies that you're reporting on have, have been based off of other samples that maybe were established through in-person surveying, but it would be great to hear, you know, how you set up a representative phone survey. Um, and let's see, that's it for now. Go ahead uh, and respond if you have an answer to that. Um, this is Nandini, I can try. Um, so yes, I think in terms of uh, a number of the surveys that we're doing in Bangladesh it is building off of existing household surveys that were representative of a certain area or population. Um, that being said, uh, for the for the Rohingya um, survey, the CBPS, uh, in our sample that we tried to recontact, uh, the the we were not able to recontact obviously more of the camp population because of the restrictions on on. Um, on, on, on phone access uh, and internet, uh, but also, as I mentioned in the talk, it was younger, uh, less educated women who tended to be left out. So there is uh, a bias there. In terms of the broader regional surveys, we're actually working with Geopol um, to do um, surveys using random digit dialing all across South Asia. Um, and that's precisely because we didn't have a, a set of baselines to, to build off of. Um, obviously, there are biases to that. So we're, you, we're not going to claim that that's representative of the whole population, but rather the population that owns or has access to a phone. Um, so the biases are less pronounced probably in, in countries like uh, Maldives and, and Bangladesh and India where there is better mobile phone penetration and probably more important in places like Afghanistan where there aren't. Um, the other thing we are trying to do is make sure that we have a minimum of uh, female respondents. A third of our sample is, is female respondents. Um, but that's all to say, I think, um, from my personal perspective, the way I see these findings is that it's a... It, you know, it's it's telling you that things are at least this bad um, because the people who are left out of these surveys are likely to be the most vulnerable. Go for it. Right. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I just, I can add to that a little bit. Um, of course, um, non-response is a big issue, but mobile phone penetration is actually quite high, at least in Kenya and in many other cases. Non-response can, to some degree, be, be fixed by, by exposed waiting. So, uh, certain groups of the population that are less likely to respond. You try to upweight relative to others. Of course, this is not perfect, but this is some of the things that we do. Um, in the paper and in, in the comparison that Mushvik mentioned, where we look across multiple settings, different samples, uh, poor samples, refugee samples, national samples, RDD samples, we find remarkably robust patterns everywhere. So the income shock is fairly large everywhere. This is a, this is a serious crisis. And sort of by, by doing that kind of work, comparing different samples and finding similar results everywhere, you can kind of say that, you know, the bias couldn't be enormous in the sense that if you find the same story in many samples, that's definitely telling a story <laughs> that, that you can't be missing. 
Yeah, so the two parts of this is, um, you know, so first of all, uh, as was clear in Nandini's response, you know, having some baseline is really useful, right? Uh, it's useful for multiple purposes. So first of all, baseline data allows a, a, a useful comparison point for you, right? But the second thing is that, look, if, if you had a baseline sample and you know what that is representative of, right? And then you call them back by phone during the COVID period, you can look at who's picking up the phone during the COVID period and whether they are systematically different from the sample that you started with, right? So not that it eliminates bias, but at least we start getting a sense of who is not picking up the phone, which then could lead to fixes like Dennis was mentioning about um, like rebating, et cetera, right? And the second uh, thing that, that helped us is, you know, related to what Dennis was saying is that, look, you know, if you find very different results in different samples. So then, you know, you start worrying about, okay, like if any one of these samples is biased, right? Are we getting the right answer from any, any, any of them? And, and that's why another, I, I think um, like something else that all, I, mean, I would, you know, uh, give out a call to all researchers to do is that rather than trying to learn a lot from one individual sample at a time, right? We should be thinking about, okay, how do we, how can we, you know, every sample will have some bias. How do we collect data from many different sources, right? We combine them and let's try and generate insights uh, that, that combines data from different sources. Dan, anything to add? Um, it, it's a little bit of a different bias question, but something that came through within, like through the web was somebody asked about bias in terms of underreporting of income streams. And that's, uh, that's, that actually is something that we've seen that we're worried about in that when you look at the consumption reported, we can't match it up to all the income streams. And it's something, fortunately, in our qualitative work, we've had a chance to dig into. And everyone tells us that other people are getting a lot more remittances than they're willing to admit. So we're trying to think of some tricky ways to get at this remittance data, because I actually, we do think that people are maybe afraid to report it because they're worried about Oh, we lost you at the last second there, but um, the question the question that Dana is, is referring to came from Colette Salami at the University of Minnesota. She said, so I sometimes worry that refugee households under report wages of aid receipt out of fear that they were, will be rendered ineligible for future assistance. Is this a valid concern? And if yes, what do you recommend we do to reduce mis mismeasurement in our microdata? So does anyone else have, have, a, have thoughts on that? I think just to add to Dan's point is um, sometimes it's better to look at some of the outcomes of, of that assistance along with the reported incomes or, or, or aid as well. So if you look at the consumption data, caloric consumption, you get a better sense of, of what's actually being received. Yeah, great. Um, so I want to move to a conversation about um, long-term welfare and social services. Um, there was a question for Dennis um, from Sarah Stillman at SIGA. How does assistance uh, fit into the rebound story that you were talking about? Could it be that it took implementers a while to reach refugees with bolstered COVID assistance? And there's sort of a, a set of related questions about the chronic issues faced by displaced people and how, um, you know, Nandini, you mentioned the impact on, on nutrition programming in Cox's Bazaar, that there was a shift to basic food baskets, which was a bit worrying. Um, Dan's work suggests that refugee households that are receiving cash transfers improve resilience. So what are the potential long-term ramifications of the crisis if, you know, various um, longer term social services are getting pushed out? And then how can policymakers not um, get too distracted by the crisis? Uh, and not forget these chronic issues faced by displaced people. Um, that was, part of that was a question from Rufus Karanja uh, in Somalia at the Regional Durable Solutions Secretariat. So any thoughts on, on that? I, I can take this, the first part that, that was addressed at me. So I would have had the different, exactly the opposite intuition in that in refugee camps, there are existing aid infrastructures, there's existing cash transfer programs and existing food aid that, that's, being, that's being delivered even before the crisis. So if anything, the response should have been faster and quicker 
to implement in, in refugee camps versus the general population where some of these systems still had to be set up. Um, when we look at our data, we don't actually see for refugees a big increase in the sources of income that they report coming from NGOs, governments, and other policy um, uh, uh, sources. And so, so therefore, I'm skeptical that a lot of this response is, is, or this rebound is, is actually due to increased aid. It seems to me more that you know this big increase in resumption of, of economic activity, going back out, uh, engaging in, in, in per, uh, interpersonal, uh, in in-person in interactions, are sort of more likely a driver of that rebound, uh, rather than sort of a big concerted aid. And, and partly maybe this is because UNHCR reports a 50% funding gap for this year. It's very difficult to to to, to get additional resources to reach to reach these households, especially when local governments are also cash strapped. And so, so at least in our data, we don't see this being a big driver, but maybe that's not true in other cases. And I can maybe jump into the second part of the question, which is sort of is cash the answer for long-term sustainability? So that's certainly what we're trying to look at in our, in our study the, with the idea that a big cash transfer could be used for uh, business investment, agriculture, that would create long-term income streams. So that's those are some of the economic results that we're going to look at at later results. I think previous research has given a little bit of reason to be skeptical about that. I think a few of the other longer-term cash studies have shown results um, decreasing over time. So I think we'd be pretty surprised if it turns out to be the answer, but maybe it's part of a more comprehensive answer. Any other thoughts on this? Um, I can come in. I think the, I think all gov all developing country governments are facing very difficult trade-offs in terms of investing to address some of the structural inequities or weaknesses of the economy or the development process, and kind of having to divert scarce resources into trying to deliver social assistance. Um, at least in South Asia, the, the, sco the scope of coverage of some of these, even the, the ones that have been scaled up for COVID is, is very minimal. Um, so I think that's a trade-off that's now happening, not just uh, within the humanitarian system, but also for governments as a whole. Um, on the issue of, of, of cash, I mean, we have some interim results from a, an evaluation of, of uh, UNHCR cash transfer um, program in, uh, in in Afghanistan, and we find there that at least in the short term, if uh, if the cash transfer is large enough, it does lead to um, some investments and assets. So we're doing a follow up, um, and we'll see if, if those effects last. But I think it's still an open question. Oh, well. Yeah, thanks. So I don't much. want to. Oh, please add, go ahead. Add a little bit to. I think the, the channels for potential long run impacts of cash could be different in this case, right? So maybe it, we don't need households to save or invest in assets for there to be long run effects. Purely by smoothing or allowing people to smooth the shock to their food consumption, together with the fact that we know that you know, a prolonged period of, of food insecurity has long run health impacts, has long run impacts on education, maybe just by immediately alleviating these, these very strong negative impacts, you might have a different case for long run effects right now relative to some of these earlier studies. And I'm super interested in, in hearing uh, Dan sort of your follow up work and seeing how, how that happens going forward. Yeah. Absolutely, I think we're all eager to, to hear more um, from these research teams. So in the interest of time, unfortunately, we only have four minutes uh, left and we got a lot of really good questions from, from the audience. Um, just FYI, we're gonna be sharing all of these questions with the research teams, even if we haven't had a chance to answer them. So um, hopefully it'll help uh, get their wheels turning. And, um, and if you, if you wanna reach out to any of the researchers, I believe their email should be um, on their academic websites or on their, on their home pages. So, um, uh, go ahead and Google. Um, one question here, I want to go back a little bit to the, to the data collection conversation. So, um, of course, you know, researchers often make a lot of assumptions about what outcomes are important. And uh, we had a question from Anne-Sophie Jesperson at the World Bank that I thought was really 
Astute, what are some innovations you have seen during COVID in terms of participatory collection of data from forcibly displaced people on how the government is providing services to them? Any thoughts on that? Um, I can try this too. Um, so this is part of um, a, a broader question that we've been trying to understand as part of our program with JDC is, is sort of what does welfare really mean in, in the context of, um, of the forcibly displaced? Um, and if you take a look at some of the comparisons on just consumption data, you don't see those differences with the host community, but you know that a lot is going on that isn't captured in, in these quantitative surveys or in the way we ask questions about their lives. Um, so we're starting some work to try and explore um, what aspirations mean in this context, how COVID may have uh, limited the capacity for, for, for aspiring, for hoping for the future, uh, both among hosts and among refugees. And the idea here, which we're still thinking about, is how to solicit this narrative without imposing our own questions on what um, on what we should ask about. So the idea is to take, uh, to get a lot of open-ended, um, have a lot of open-ended discussions and then use uh, natural language processing to analyze that. Um, and hopefully that's a step in the right direction. I think we do need to do more in terms of um, flipping who asks the question and whose data it is. Super. Bangladesh government has uh invested in uh, quite a few innovative techniques during the COVID period. Um, so one is there was a 333 number that was like a government hotline number. So that was repurposed as like a COVID distress call, right? So people could uh, call in and, you know, either just simply report, right? What challenge that they're, they're facing or whether they have symptoms, right? Or, uh, and, and then it, either immediately or after the call, it can be followed up with like a person calling you back. Um, and uh, so that, you know, initially, especially when uh, our testing infrastructure was extremely poor, it's still inadequate, but uh, when it was extremely poor, this was an important source of data to try and figure out exactly what areas the disease was uh, spreading, for example. That's great, thank you. And um, I know we're at time here, but I have one more very pressing question and, and it also came from Sebastian at IPA. Um, how is any of this evidence that you've presented with us being used uh, as part of the response, if at all? Can anyone tell a short anecdote about who you're sharing this with and how it might be influencing their decisions now or in the future? Uh, but yeah, in our case, it was, uh you know, UNHCR, who we're sharing it with. And in fact, um, we then designed, immediately designed a, um, a, a set of interventions, which through the UNHCR sort of local office in Cox's um, you know, on exactly what is the type of misinformation that needs to be addressed in, uh, and, and who are the, like the local community leaders that we need to um, spread information through. Great. Anyone else? Um, I think, we've, think we've the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I would just say we've also been, been in touch with our results with the, the local UNHCR teams. And we, we, um, we did design the survey to try and provide some really quick feedback loops specifically around whether the COVID knowledge and the, the actual, um, like the ability to say wash hands and have protective equipment was there at the camp. Uh, with the idea of having quick feedback loops, but uh, fortunately, we actually found that, um, that that those circumstances were doing pretty well, so there wasn't need for rapid response. Great, Nandini. Um, I think just to say that all these data collection efforts at the the World Bank are are, are targeted so not only at um, at sort of supporting the government response, but also for our own um, internal consumption in terms of what projects go out, uh, what shape and form they take and who they're targeting. Um, I think at the start of the crisis, we had some sense of who would be vulnerable, but not exactly um, sort of how challenging the scaling up on, this, on the safety net side would be for many of these governments. So that continues to be uh, prioritizing what kind of relief and how to deliver it is, is a major challenge in South Asia at least. Over. Yeah. Yeah, and then in our, in our case, I mean, the, the main thing for us was to get this data out 
to as many people as fast as possible, which is why we have this website. Um, and it was actually quite interesting that sort of, you know, as you put the website information out, we got lots of requests from different county governments within Kenya that are grappling with this. Hey, can you tell me specifically about this count, uh, county? We had the, uh, the uh, curriculum development uh, agency and the Kenyan government sort of add tack on a few questions on education that they were particularly interested in that we could sort of report back very rapidly. And, and, and my sense was just that there was such a need for data and for understanding what's going on that just putting this out there, starting conversations, um, disseminating it as widely as possible was, was a good thing and an important thing to do. Awesome, thank you. Um, so thank you all so much, all the panelists for joining us. Um, thanks to uh, the Berkeley Conversations team for hosting us at UC Berkeley. Uh, to my SEGA staff, my SEGA colleagues, um, our friends at IPA and the Joint Data Center. Uh, I'm really glad that we're doing this, these joint webinars, and I hope that um, all of you who have joined today will share uh, the link with others and stay tuned for information about our next webinar, hopefully coming through in a, in a couple of weeks. So um, thanks to all of you for joining us. I uh, hope this was interesting and ha have a great rest of the week. Thank you. Admirable job. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>